Mike, but we're here with Greg Turner, four-time winner on the European Tour, two-time New Zealand Open winner, and of course, a member of that famous 1998 President's Cup winning side. Uh, Greg, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, really appreciate you, you being with us. Let's start off right back at the beginning, Greg, where it, where it began, and, and you were born into what could be argued a very talented sporting Dunedin family. Uh, your brother, obviously quite a famous cricketer representing New Zealand, and you had another brother that was uh, representing New Zealand in hockey. How did you gravitate with that in the family? How did, how did you actually gravitate towards golf? Well, yeah, I mean, I sometimes joke, I feel like I had sort of three fathers rather than two brothers. Um, Glenn, they're, they're sort of 16 and 20 years older than me. So um, I, it'd be fair to say there wasn't a lot of backyard cricket played um, with me. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just grew up in an environment where excelling at sport was normal. So um, I suspect that had an impact in terms of, um, you know, making or, or, or making me feel that... Um, that, that excelling was possible. Uh, um, you know, I think yeah, there's a big hurdle to overcome when you're a young person um, in terms of, uh, you know, wondering whether you could ever be good enough to, to, you know, to achieve an elite sport. And I guess that was removed from me a bit because it was sort of in the family anyway. Um, you know, I can, I sometimes joke a bit about, I get asked why I play golf. And uh, I remember Glenn coming back from a tour of the West Indies and I would have been, Oh, I guess I was maybe 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, and, uh, and he'd had four double hundreds in that tour and, um, and, you know, against a pretty fearsome West Indies bowling attack. And he was getting changed to go and play cricket for Green Island because that's what you did in those days. <laughs> you played club cricket as well. And, uh, and I wandered into the room and he was getting changed. Anyway, he was absolutely black and blue. I mean, he'd been pummeled. He'd batted for hours against that West Indian attack. And, I mean, he was bruised beyond belief. And, um, and I think it occurred to me at the time, if that's what you get when you're really good, <laughs> maybe I'll play golf. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, so, you know, being sort of effectively an only child, but with a, in a, from an environment where sport, selling in sport was, was kind of normal, um, I, you know, I think golf, um, you know, was something I could do. I could do on my own. Um, my best mate at high school, a guy I'd never met before, was a guy named David Skeggs. His old man was the, happened to be the mayor at the time, which was handy. Um, Right. And he played golf, so we used to used to take me out. And we'd go and started playing golf together when I was about, I guess that was at high school when I was about thirteen. So, um, but in those days, you played all sports. Um, but I, so I still played a lot of cricket and a lot of hockey and some soccer and a bit of tennis. And um, but golf was sort of the thing that was easiest to do on your own, really. So one thing, one thing that's quite evident these days. I mean, you've you've just talked about starting golf at thirteen, and I know a lot of people of your generation. Uh, started around 13 and 14 because I guess you couldn't get into golf clubs before then. What what do you think about kids these days? You know, starting at six and seven and eight. Um, uh, look, I, I mean, I think I think it's great that that kids got the opportunity to start at an early age. That said, I don't think that means you've got to push them uh, at an early age, or an, and I don't think it's. Um, and in general, I think trying to get kids to specialise too young is a mistake. I think that there are an awful, it's an awfully broad range of skills um, and talents that ultimately might lead you to become successful at any given sport. And, and I think that they evolve from, from all sorts of areas. Um, you know, for every time you see a Tiger Woods or someone like that, who knows how many young um, kids might have turned into great players if they hadn't been pushed so hard, if they'd been given an opportunity to have a more balanced and a broader sort of um, experience in sport. I think sport's great. Um, and and I'm certainly with our kids, we've encouraged them to play all sorts of sports. But, um, and, and, and they'll, you know, for my money, they'll specialise when they're ready to specialise, when they want to specialise. But, you know, the stuff you can learn, um, you know, playing team sports, for instance, um, it's still going to stand you in good stead on a golf course in the future if that's where you're going to end up. So um, I don't think I don't think you can ever start too young. But I but I hate to see uh, kids getting pushed too hard too soon. Yeah. Yep. So in terms of so you started at 13. In terms of your amateur career, um, you know, did you play in club championships? Did you make representative sides uh, for Otago at that stage? I mean, what was your what was your first handicap? How, how did you how quickly did you progress? 
Yeah, my first first handicap I, I had was seven. Um, that's yeah. the highest I've ever been on. So, uh, um, you know, I, I you know I I was a quick learner. I think I was always you know I played a bit before I got a handicap. I, I joined up at Bell Nows, which is a nine hole course on the hill near Otago Boys. And we used to play there a bit. We go to Chisholm, but um, um, but we never really put any cards in. We just you know played around. And it wasn't until I joined Bell Mac when I suppose I was. Um, the target golf club that is, of course, when I was I'm, I'm, I'm probably late 14, about 14, that I got a handicap. Yeah, so seven was um, as high as I've ever been. But um, uh, so I can't remember the first representative team I had. Otago had a really good, really strong team in those days. Um, you know, we had guys like Jeff Clark and, and Ronnie Johnson and... Um, uh, Brian Newell and Mike Atkinson and John Finn and John Sanders and you know there was a, a whole heap of really good players so it was a hard team to get into but it was a good team to you know it was good to be around um, uh, guys that were really top amateurs. In fact, I can remember my first. I'm pretty sure my first New Zealand amateur, funnily enough, was at Parapran Beach and um, and and I probably I must have been only 16 or 17 and they used to have the New Zealand foursomes um, was on the day before and. Um, and I got to partner Jeff Clark, who was one of the top amateurs in the country at the time, and that was a huge um, uh, thrill for a young fella, um, you know, around around a course like Paraparam, which is you know well, straight away became one of my favourites and still is to this day. So um, it's funny how those little connections evolved. Yeah, yeah, that would. Uh, I'm trying to think who won that year was that the late seventies? It would have been. I think I yeah I think I think John Durry. Probably John Durry, yeah. John Durry would have won. Pretty sure John Durry beat John Finn in the final. Okay. Uh, I think. Okay. Um, I wasn't around for the final. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was a it was a great experience, and and you know, and I and I can I can well remember really looking forward to to going and, and playing Paraparam Beach. That um, I played quite a bit at Chisholm um, in Dunedin, so. Um, Sort of developed a bit of a love of Lynx golf anyway. So, and Parapram was was then and still probably is regarded as, as um, you know, well, you know, along with Terry Eady as the two finest sort of Lynx in the country. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was a real, um, an eye opener is the wrong word, but I mean, I think that cemented um, a love for Lynx golf, which has, has endured to, to, to this day, really. How quickly did you turn professional? I went to university in the states. I went. Uh, I got a college scholarship, and um, so I didn't turn. Uh, I turned professional straight after the World Amateur, the um, Eisenhower Trophy. Was uh, I was in the? I played two of those. One when I was my first year of college, and then um, in Hong Kong, um, and that was in '84. Uh, and that was sort of November '84. So I was 21, um, and I turned pro straight after that. Yeah, okay, okay. Good. First time, obviously, I met you, Greg, was uh, we walked around Mount Monganui Golf Club together. I was a superintendent <laughs> there. And I think that was where you had your first tournament victory, was it? Or your first yeah. professional victory? Yeah, my first, first tournaments I played were I played a, um, the uh, Airlines tournament at um, Titarang. It was my first tournament as a pro. And then I'm pretty sure it was at Paraparam in the New Zealand Open. And I'm trying to think. You were '84. That might have been. Would that have been Corey Pavin? Corey Pavin won in '84. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, and then um, and then the old PJ at the Mount, which was played over New Year, finished on New Year's Day. Um, yeah, right. Cool. Yeah, yeah so, and that was so that. So you ended up was, on the on the European tour, um, and I'm thinking if you turned pro in '84, and, and I know you won a tournament in '86, that was a fairly uh, quick ascent. Um, these days, you know, it can be a lot, a lot harder, I guess, and a lot longer to, to establish yourself on the tour. What was the pathway between between turning professional and, and, and winning your first event? Yeah, well, those, I mean, those, you know, in those days, <laughs> you uh, you sort of played, you played. Well, the Australasian tour was a lot longer. We had a lot, you know, a lot of state opens, and I think from memory, I want to say we had about fourteen or sixteen weeks in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, there was the PGA and New Zealand Open and the airlines in New Zealand. And then, um, and actually, I remember going after the, this is how sort of naive I was a little bit. Um, after winning the PGA, I went over to Tasmania Open, was a couple of weeks later. And I would, and I pre, went pre qualified at, I think it was Devonport Golf Club from memory. 
anyway, um, I got through the pre-qualifying all right, which is always a bit of a, you know, the 18 hole pre-qualifying is a bit of a shootout. And uh, when I was uh, coming out of the office after signing my card, the guy who was the chairman of the, or the secretary of the PGA at the time said to me, oh, why did you qualify today? You, that New Zealand PGA, you won the PGA, that makes you exempt. All right. <laughs> so anyway, um, so no, I played, played, played Australia and then sort of the pathway from there was to go up to Asia. There was a nine, nine-week tour of, of Asia. Um, Were you doing this with other, other Kiwis at the time or other Australasian mates? Yeah, or? Plenty of Kiwis. There were lots of Kiwis playing then. Um, you know, Frank Nobolo was a good, good player then. There was, um, you know, Simon Owen was still playing quite a bit. Um, uh, Stewie Reese and, um, um, and, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of it. There was, there was a bunch of Kiwis. Richard Coombs was playing a lot. You know, yeah. you, you could sort of play Australia and, and, and to a lesser extent, Asia and from being a club pro in those days too. Um, not so many up in Asia. I think there was just myself and Frank and, and a few of the Aussie boys. But the fir- first tournament on that Asian tour was was the Hong Kong Open. And I um, finished fourth in the World Amateur there, the Eisenhower, in, in November. So um, they were kind enough to give me an invite. Um, and again, because qualifying, it was Monday qualifying, the old days where you if you made the cut, you were in the next week. If you missed the cut, you went ahead and you had to pre-qualify on the Monday. And, um, and that was, all, you know, Asian tour was lots of guys out of America and Australia and, and from all over the place. There was some Swedes and um, it was pretty competitive. Um, so it was good to get a, an invite first week and I made the cut. Um, and so they got me into Malaysia and I played pretty nice. From memory, I think in Malaysia I finished, um, I think I finished sixth or seventh. Um, and then uh, and then we went off to Thailand and I played okay and then to India. Um, and then came back to Singapore and I finished lost in a playoff in Singapore. So, um, 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 that was, that was what did, you know, I did well enough in those first few weeks to get my exempt for the rest of the tour. And, um, um, so that, you know, that was a real help, you know, little things make a big difference. And you know, I sometimes say this to people when they look at young guys these days, man, you just need a break at the right time and you can't underestimate how one break sometimes if I hadn't got that invite into Hong Kong, maybe I would have missed the cut. If I would missed the cut there, would I have got in the next week? And, you know, the whole story might be different. So, so anyway, that was Asia. And then we sort of played in around the Pacific Islands. And, um, and then I went off to the tour school, school in Europe. And um, the plan was, in those, it, my plan was to see if I, if I get my card in Europe, to play a couple of years in Europe and then, uh, and then go back to America. Um, and I, I played nicely in tour school in Europe, finished third, I think, behind uh, Elizabeth won. So he turned out to be not a bad player. Yeah. And um, an Argentinian guy, Adam Sauer, who was a good player too. Um, anyway, um, got my card in, in Europe. Then it was back down to Australia and played Australia, Asia again, and was lucky enough um, uh, to win in Singapore. So I'd, I'd lost my player for the year before, won in Singapore. Um, so that sort of gave me some good momentum to carry forward into Europe. And then... Um, you know, I was lucky enough in my first season in Europe to win um, as a rookie in Scandinavia, beat um, Craig Stadler in a play. Yeah, um, that. So that kind of got me established there. So, um, so all in all, I had a pretty, um, you know, relatively smooth ride, I suppose. 